Hello, and a very warm welcome to this podcast on anxiety disorders. In this podcast, we shall be introducing some basic principles that describe the most common anxiety disorders, namely generalised anxiety disorder, panic disorder, phobic disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. This podcast should therefore provide you a solid foundation to both your clinical experience of these conditions and your further reading. So let's start with generalised anxiety disorder. Generalised anxiety disorder describes a persistent and excessive anxiety that importantly is out of place with the patient's situation. It affects twice as many women as men and it is estimated to affect up to 5% of the population. The most common age of onset is usually between 15 and 25 years of age. In terms of etiology, there may be both a genetic component, such as having an avoidant or anxious personality, and an environmental component, such as an anxious parent. It is also well known that stressful situations in a patient's life may both precipitate and perpetuate the condition. There are several features of generalised anxiety disorder that are routinely described as free-floating anxiety symptoms. These are grouped into apprehensional, motor and autonomic symptoms. The apprehensional symptoms include poor concentration, a fear of impending doom, feeling on edge, and often preoccupation with past or future events. Note that these are frequently described as psychological features. The most common motor symptoms are restlessness, trembling, and tension headaches. And the autonomic symptoms include lightheadedness, a tachycardia, and a sensation of breathlessness. In more severe cases, patients may experience what we term depersonalization and derealization. Depersonalization occurs when the patient feels a loss of their sense of identity, i.e. they feel that they aren't real or have an altered sense of reality of themselves. Derealization, on the other hand, is when the patient's surroundings don't feel real, rather than themselves. There are a lot of disorders that can present with the features described above. And these may be other psychiatric conditions or indeed physical conditions. Other psychiatric disorders include panic disorder, phobic disorder, OCD, schizophrenia and drug withdrawal symptoms, in particular delirium tremens following alcohol cessation. Important physical or medical conditions that must be excluded include pheochromocytoma, thyrotoxicosis and worries about a specific underlying physical problem that, aren't un, uh, that are unexpressed, for example um, a breast lump. There are a variety of components to the management of generalised anxiety disorder. Some straightforward psychological treatments that may be appropriate to less severe or highly motivated patients include basic counselling and self-help books, and I think it will be fair to say that these may be extremely effective. In addition, cognitive therapy, or CBT, may also be beneficial in helping patients identify anxious thoughts and help curtail continued spiralling of these thoughts. Anxiety management techniques such as relaxation techniques and tapes may also be used. Moving on to drug therapy, this should ideally be divided into short-acting and long-acting treatments. The short-acting drugs are used to rapidly treat the onset of anxiety symptoms. Benzodiazepines such as alprazolam or diazepam are very good at treating symptoms of anxiety, but should not be prescribed for more than four weeks due to both their sedative effects and the risk of dependency. The long-acting treatments are often used if first-line psychological therapy has failed. Most commonly, SSRIs or SNRIs such as venoflexine are used, and these are better tolerated and now are probably more widely used than the tricyclic antidepressants and MAOIs. For additional symptom control, beta blockers may also be used to treat the autonomic symptoms of anxiety. Very occasionally, low-dose antipsychotic medications may be needed. So let's move on now to talk about panic disorder. This is a condition that is characterised by periods of very severe anxiety. Various fears occur, but the fear of dying or losing control are cardinal features and are often accompanied by severe physical symptoms such as breathlessness, chest pain, dizziness, palpitations and tremor. If such attacks occur during specific situations, 
patients often then develop an avoidance of similar situation and consequent phobias. Panic disorder, just like generalized anxiety disorder, occurs more in females than males, and are more common than you might expect, affecting up to 1-2% to of the population. The average age of onset is between 20 and 40 years. It is now thought that there is a genetic component that results in patients having a predisposition to heightened autonomic arousal. As with generalized anxiety disorder, you must always consider the presence of additional psychiatric conditions and other physical ailments. The mainstay of management for panic disorder is CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, which in this setting is extremely effective with nearly 100% of patients successfully treated. In addition, as for generalized anxiety disorder, anxiety management techniques can also be used. Drug treatments are less successful here, with a success rate of about 60%, as the condition may return when the patient stops taking their treatment. SSRIs are the second line treatment if CBT fails, though clomipramine, which is a tricyclic antidepressant, can be extremely effective. Phobic disorders are defined as inappropriate situational anxiety together with avoidance. There are three main types to be aware of. These are agoraphobia, isolated or specific phobias, and social phobia. Agoraphobia is literally translated a fear of the marketplace, which essentially means fear of crowds or open public spaces. This can be severe enough to render the patient housebound, and drug or alcohol use is common to overcome this fear. Specific or isolated phobias are phobias to specific things such as snakes, flying or spiders. The majority of those with a specific phobia do not seek treatment unless their condition becomes what we term functional, i.e. it affects their everyday life. Social phobias are a fear of situations where the person may be subject to criticism from others or fears that they may embarrass themselves in social situations. The management of phobic disorders consists, as with most conditions here, of both psychological and pharmacological treatments. Behavioural therapy is the treatment of choice and can be very successful. Examples of behavioural therapies include systemic desensitization, where the patient is exposed to increasing levels of the phobic stimulus, or flooding, where the patient is maximally exposed to their fear until their anxiety subsides. For agoraphobia and social phobia, CBT is the treatment of choice. Pharmacotherapy is used for the treatment of anxiety and depression that frequently coexists with these disorders. SSRIs are second-line treatment if CBT fails, and tricyclics are useful for those with depressive features. Benzodiazepines can be taken before the exposure to phobic stimuli in order to reduce anxiety, and beta blockers can also be used to treat somatic symptoms of anxiety. So finally in this podcast, we're going to discuss obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD. The hallmarks of OCD are inappropriate and intrusional thoughts, which are only relieved by acting out various compulsions that the patient may have. The obsessive thoughts vary from intrusive, unwanted thoughts to catastrophic thinking, and the rituals are specific to the individual, but usually involve cleaning, washing hands, checking lights and locks. Interestingly, the number of rituals is often related to three, or a multiple of three. Sometimes the rituals are related to the obsessional thoughts, such that obsessive thoughts about avoiding germs um, can then lead to ritualized washing. The individual can recognize that the rituals themselves are silly, or know that the catastrophic thinking is exactly that, but cannot stop such thoughts from pervading their consciousness. Importantly, obsessive compulsive disorder can occur um, or can coexist with depressive disorders, generalized anxiety disorder, and anorexia nervosa. Additionally, there may be obsessive thoughts about harming the patient's baby in a condition known as puerperal psychosis. Management of OCD occurs in the form of psychological and pharmacological therapies. CBT is effective at treating this disorder, but it is important to note that it is easier to treat the rituals rather than the ruminations. Drug therapies commonly employed include SSRIs or TCAs, which at high doses are extremely effective at treating OCD. Benzodiazepines can once again be used to relieve short-term anxiety. So, in summary, in this podcast we've looked at a variety of types of anxiety disorders. 
Remember that the term anxiety disorder encompasses a number of conditions, including generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorders, phobic disorders, and OCD. Note also that these conditions share many important psychological and physical signs and symptoms and indeed treatment. Try, if possible, while acknowledging this, to be clear about specific features of each of the conditions and which therapies are most successful and useful in each setting. So, I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Thanks for listening and see you soon.